get into some of our content. Okay, perfect. So what we're going to do in our session um, is we're going to, um, well, we've gotten started and we're going to talk about the why of uh, really wanting to make sure you're welcoming your students. And some of that uh, leads perfectly from that keynote of why it's important to do the things we're going to be talking about today. Um, we're going to talk about creating these welcoming spaces in terms of uh, homepage ideas, um, an orientation model module for your students, and then also how to keep this going even after you welcome them. How do you continue and um, continue a welcome space throughout the entire semester. Um, and then we're going to actually have a demonstration of showing just some of these things in practice for you guys. Um, and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, so that's our uh, plan for today. Um, and if you have any questions, please just enter them in the chat. We'll be monitoring those. We'll try to answer those uh, as we go. Um, something to know is we're going to kind of be overviewing in the beginning of these initial points. Um, and then that demonstration is where we'll go into a little bit more detail so you can see how some of those things play out, particularly when it gets to um, like homepage design. So we'll go ahead and get started with Katie telling us about the why. And also, as um, as we're going through these, I would like, as Michelle did, just acknowledge the expertise in this Zoom room and feel free in the chat, kind of in our back channel, we're a small group. As you have ideas of what you're doing in these areas, um, please feel free to share that uh, with the folks that are um, here. So we welcome that sharing for sure. So this is our why slide um, on the first kind of section over there on the left. Um, and, and for folks who were at the keynote session earlier, Michelle really dug deep into our why, um, why it's important to welcome our online students. And we'll share that recording too, in case anybody wasn't there. But in the words of a student, a Mesa student that was on a Mesa Pathways panel last semester, over on that left side showing that you care, you see me and I see you. That was the student's response to a question that was posed to them, how can we best support you? And that took place in September, so just a few months ago. And that's what the student's answer was. This is a screenshot of my tweet quoting her that day because I thought it was just like brilliant, um, the words that she used to convey that. It's really about us showing them that we care. And then in that middle box, a couple of years ago, um, during the Digital Learning Day online conference, Daniel Contreras, a community college student at Solano Community College, shared his experience and perspective um, as a returning student. He shares about his online teacher saying, I had never met a professor that had such a culture of completion and caring. This guy wanted me to finish the class and do well. He was showing it with so much energy and so much passion, you know, just through Canvas. So we link in our slides, we have a link to the full nine minute video of Daniel sharing his experience as an online student. We don't have time to watch that um, right now, but we'll put our slides in the Canvas shell and we encourage you to watch that when you have the time. But again, Daniel, like that student in the panel, they both mentioned that idea of caring and showing that you care being the aspect that impacts their success online. So then juxtapose this with our bot, right? Here we've linked another video for you to watch when you get a chance. It's a, it's a, a video that kind of depicts the um, online set it and forget it method to online teaching, right? Which basically consists of automated generic text instructions with no human presence, no human support, no evidence, of anyone caring um, in a very sterile and isolating online experience. So um, it, it's, that, it's that welcoming students to our online class is how we begin to show them that we care about their success. So that's why it's important. That's why we're talking about it today, a week before our classes start. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Christina. Okay. So yeah, so we know that it's very important to really humanize your course to welcome your students. And so as mentioned, we're gonna talk about this in three different elements, your kind of homepage of welcoming them, grounding them into your course, um, orienting them to your course, but then keeping that welcoming environment going. And so we'll start by focusing on the homepage, but to include there. Um, and we're gonna do this by looking at three different components, how you lay out 
your homepage, which is something very important. It's like the first thing that students will see, right, when they enter your course. Uh, we'll talk about creating a welcoming message to your students. Um, and we'll also talk about creating a humanizing uh, video uh, so that you don't just appear as, you know, all text and a robot. They get to see a human face um, as they go through your course. And so we'll begin with talking about uh, the homepage layout, some things to consider. And again, we'll go into a little bit more depth than this with our demonstration later. Um, so when we're thinking about doing our homepage layout, um, you want to make sure that you're using clear, concise, and accessible text. Um, so clarity is going to be important so that they can um, understand what they should be doing, that it's very clear to them, um, and that it's not very lengthy, right? We all do that uh, still, right? If you see something just a block of text, you don't necessarily read through it as thoroughly. Um, you might get put off. So think about like the welcoming message when you have something very clear and concise. And then very importantly, uh, making sure that it's accessible. So these are some components that we're going to talk about as well. So making sure when you're presenting um, different materials that you have the proper color color contrast, um, how you're using color for someone who might be colorblind, right? Um, or if someone's using a screen reader, uh, do you have behind the scenes things going on correctly so that it's accessible and will be read correctly? Um, because that's the first thing, right? They hit your homepage and if it's not accessible for them, that instantly tells them as a student, oh, this is not gonna be welcoming. This is gonna be a problem course. Um, they don't have it, right? So we wanna really consider those things from the very beginning. Um, and then you also wanna make sure that you clearly indicate uh, where the student is supposed to go next. So you have this welcoming homepage, uh, but they're not just there and left to their own devices. You also point them, especially uh, if you're doing asynchronous and so they don't have uh, you talking to them on the first day, they really need to know how to where they should go next and how to get there. Um, and so I will show you some examples of my homepage evolving over the past three semesters, just to give you an idea. Uh, so this one we can see is fall 2019. Um, and I'm using mine because there are errors and you can see the errors and the changes over time. Uh, so this one, fall 2019, of course we were, this was an on-campus course at the time. And so this wasn't the initial homepage. It was you know, still in the classroom and this was where you come. Uh, but you can see that uh, even the getting started section, it has the element that you'd want a homepage to have. Uh, but the getting started has like all these different links. Should I click on the syllabus? Should I click on the modules? Even though there is like a paragraph in a course, this could be clearer. This could be more concise. This could be easier for students to see. Um, so there's a lot of information and you can see it continues to go and you would have to scroll versus what I did um, last semester. So in fall 2020, same course, um, but I gave a nice big banner because even though they have the course title here, with all the courses being online, it's nice if there's something just very clear that the student will know they're in the right place, they're on the right course that they need to be in. Um, so it adds a little bit of something welcoming. You can do an image instead of just a text course banner. So it's up to you to really make it um, how you would like it to be. Um, I had an opening um, kind of um, interest grabber, but I also put this on my syllabus. So I've decided to actually remove it this semester to make this even more concise. But you can see what I've done with the information is instead of having it all on the homepage, I've boxed it to common questions and then where they could go to get more help. So like common questions students would have throughout the semester, you know, when stuff do, what's coming up, and then they can click here. And this clicking here would actually take them to the syllabus where they see the schedule in a little bit more detail I put on that page. Um, and then I put right here, big and bold and red, if it's the first day, click here so they know where to go. And so this seems like, oh, it should be it's pretty organized and it's very clear where they get, but I already did a mistake that I told you guys about where I'm only indicating first day, it stands out to me because I don't have any issues with color vision. But if you do, if you have like red, green color blindness, for example, this first day is not gonna stand out like I'm hoping it would. So it's not as welcoming to all students. And even more so when I created these boxes, I did something that we commonly do where we just create something that visually gets the appeal that we want without thinking about the HTML behind it. And that limits the accessibility for students who are doing a screen reader. So you can actually, if I were to go into editing this page, um, you actually have this little box here that is how you check for accessibility. So it's not completely, you don't have to worry about you knowing everything. You can actually click it in Canvas and it will pop up and tell you. Uh, so here we can see issue one of nine. So many problems with this homepage. And the first is telling us that table should include a caption. So if you've ever used tables to try and uh, place things around your screen, don't do that. Only use a table when you actually have a table that you're presenting of information where your uh, columns and rows have headers, you're, you're captioning or titling your, your table. Otherwise, it really messes up how the information is being presented to students who really rely on that screen reader. So that's a accessibility concern. This is what I'm currently, this is my development shell. So this is something that hopes to be finished by next week, right? Still one week away, but still planning. Um, this is my shell um, this semester. So first thing you'll notice, there's no scrolling. 
everything is right there, right there that I want them to see on the homepage. Uh, it has the banner that indicates where they are. I do a hello and a welcome. Um, I included a photo of myself on that homepage just to like let them know, hey, human being teaching this course, I'm here. You got questions, reach out, tell them that from the very beginning, setting that tone. Um, and then I tell them, I direct them, click a link below. And then these are the links. So it's the first day, I put that first and very clearly, and I'm not distinguishing it separate. It's the first question, just first day, click here, and this is gonna take them where they need to go to the orientation model module. Uh, what's happening this week? So as the semester goes on, if they don't wanna scroll through the module, they're wondering where we are, they can click here. And I really develop out the syllabus page so that they can see exactly what they should be working on that week. I didn't put my contact information on the homepage. Instead, it's just one click away and it has all the information to contact me. Um, if they have course questions, this actually takes them to the syllabus, letting them know, hey, check the syllabus first and then uh, check me if you still have questions and then this links to all those different services that we offer here at Mesa and such and the best thing about this homepage is very simple very concise clear um, but even better if I were to check the accessibility checker who doesn't want balloons and confetti right letting you know that you've done it and that it looks good and it works behind the scenes as well so we'll talk about how you can get that how you can get the balloons and confettis on your site as well uh, but next let's go ahead and katie's going to tell us about uh, creating a welcoming message for your students yes nice so that overall layout of our homepage can convey care right that's what we're trying to do is convey care and how the layout itself can convey care um, to our students so as can the words that we use to welcome our students that in that welcome message. So a welcome message might be a blurb on the homepage. You saw an announcement on Christina's. It might be that announcement that gets added. You can add your announcement to the top of your homepage. Perhaps it's a Canvas message or an email. So there's several options for which tool to use. In the um, humanizing keynote, we just heard about liquid syllabus uh, Google site. Um, so lots of tools, but the point is to actually use it to reach out to your students as early as possible to welcome them to the online space in your voice, right? And not necessarily your voice, but using your words um, and your, your um, like what you authentically bring to this to the space. I think the goal here is really to tell students that you are in the right place, right? They're in the right place. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide, Christina. You can also incorporate a welcome video to welcome your students. This is a welcome um, homepage from, example from Professor Luann Gibson. So she welcomes students with this banner image that reads, I believe in you, right? Then she has a picture of herself along with an affirming message. I am here to help you every step of the way on, on your journey through the semester. Um, so this is Luann's way of showing she cares through words and images as that first impression to students. It's how she welcomes and begins building that safe space for her students. Um, and then she repeats this same blurb out to students as an announcement in case um, so that they also receive the email notification welcoming. And you can see at the bottom there a welcome uh, video, which we'll talk about in a second too. So this is an example of just like that intentionality of telling students that they're in the right place and that, and I mean, it literally says, I believe in you, right? Welcoming them to that space. Go ahead, Christina. So next we'll talk about that humanizing video. Um, and what's great is that it can go, as Katie just uh, showed in that example, on your homepage, or you can make it part of your orientation module, but it's just important to have some kind of welcoming humanizing video um, because you wanna speak directly to them, right? Um, when we mentioned how do you welcome students in the class and um, when we're on campus, you do something that's still interaction, right? You don't just tell them, read this thing. That's not how you welcome them, right? So you wanna still do something. Um, and so if you're if possible, do make an actual video that includes your face. Um, if you can't, if you absolutely can't, then do voice, but also include an image of yourself at least. Something that connects your voice and your face uh, so that the students can see that, that being human with them. Um, and then also uh, try to think about sharing something about yourself that will allow the students to connect with you. And so what that is, I can't say, because everyone has different experiences and different things that are gonna connect with students. And so you wanna use what's for you. So I could tell them like random things like, oh, I really love tennis and making jewelry in my free time. Some students, if they have the same interest will care, 
rest of the students would care less, right? It doesn't really connect them. So instead, something that I do in my video is I tell them about my academic journey. So it not only leads them to why I'm teaching this course and my qualifications for it, but I tell them because my story is that I actually began in a community college, in St. Louis Community College, taking dual enrollment classes in high school. So that instantly connects with all the students who are clearly taking a course at a community college. And then I tell them about my progression through getting a bachelor's, going out to the real world, not just staying in academia, working in advertising, but then coming back and getting another bachelor's, my master's and my PhD and now being on the other end. And so then I let them know that like my brother and I, we were first generation college students. So bringing in that talk from before, belonging. So a lot of times with your first generation or other um, historically underrepresented groups, it's nice to hear that someone else kind of shares that and can understand. And so I tell them not only to reach out to me with course questions, but if they have questions about their progress, things that usually would just come up in conversation if someone's been there before, but if you don't have it, that your professors are great resources. That gives them a chance to, to see you as a human as well. Like, oh, I can ask, like, should I take this next course? What should I be thinking about in terms of transfer? Something like that. So again, what you ultimately share is completely up to you and your story, but think about trying to share something that's going to be a bit more personal, a bit more vulnerable maybe, uh, but it allows a truer connection with your students versus just interest and things like that, that not everyone might be able to connect with. And so that's kind of our just kind of brief overview of some ideas to think about when you're creating that home for your students this semester. What we're now going to move on to is talk about that orientation module and really getting students acquainted with your course. Um, and so we're going to talk about um, how to create a course tour, a welcome survey, and then community building discussion. And so we'll begin with the course tour video uh, with Kate, or yeah, the overall module and leading to the course video. Yeah. So, um feel free to chime in, especially during this section of things that if you're building an orientation module, if there's um, elements that you are including that you found useful. Um, we do have an orientation module available out in the Canvas Commons for you to import so that you don't have to build this from scratch. If you search um, in the Commons, Katie Palacios, you'll see one of the, um, this, this is the orientation module that will come in. Um, but it's really a space that aims to get everyone on the same page, as much as possible anyway, right? So there's students who will already know about these services and supports available to them, but others who won't. And so, and others will have family members to help them navigate and others won't, right? So an orientation module is kind of a great spot to curate those services for students who might need them. And when we, by providing these links, by providing the space to students, we it's like another way to affirm them being there. So whether or not you need the services we're providing them to you, we, it's one of those ways of telling students, we see you in that online class. My kids are like screaming in the living room. So in case you hear any, they're not on Zoom so that I have a good connection. But the problem is, is that they're like wrestling in the living room or something. So you might hear them in the background. Um, okay. So that is, that's, this is the screenshot of the, the module for import. It will come with the links, but of course, the filters from scratch, they're placeholders and really about making this yours, putting your own touch on this, um, adding pages, removing pages, um, orientations can and really should be customized because for your course, you'll have different resources, um, different things that students need to access for um, the subject area, et cetera. So here's how on the next screen, you'll see how Christina has customized hers. Hers is, com she combines a lot of that content into that first page in one support page. So that's a good way of handling a lot of, instead of one, if you don't want all those links in one module, you could put it all in one page. And as you'll see um, in the next screenshot, she's created tabs on that page to break that up even further. So in the, in the Canvas shell, I put um, a how-to on creating tabs in case there's folks who wanna create those tabs. I'm wondering how she did that. Um, so that's kind of our, that's like a, a general sense of uh, what this orientation is. I think of it as almost like a safety net that you're presenting to students prior to, like, look at all these amazing things. If you need them, they're here for you. And if you don't, then they're still here for you. Um, and then an important ingredient of our orientation module is the course tour video. So you can go to the next, there we go. Um, so no two courses are the same. I actually sent out a course tour video kind of um, yeah, it was a welcome video plus a course tour video that I sent out as part of the Catalyst shell. Um, but a video can help students get acquainted with the course, right? You might consider highlighting elements of your course that you know are different than other courses. So for example, 
Um, this course will be different because we're going to use Padlet for discussions instead of can Canvas discussions. Or in this course, we're going to rely a lot on embedding images because this is a photography course or um, you know, whatever it might be that would make it different from other Canvas courses that students might have taken. So, um, and then, like I say, if it makes sense to combine it with your welcome, then that's fine too, um, as we did. So it just it, the orientation module really creates a space to share those supports with students. Um, the course tour video shows how we care about them navigating successfully and, and being intentional about saying to students, hey, I know this might be different. I know this might be new, um, but here's lots of resources for, your, for you to be successful. So, um, and another reminder that we have included several videos in the Canvas on, on building the welcome page and the, the orientation video. So if you're looking for help with that. What's next? The welcome survey. And then we'll talk about including um, a welcome survey. And you might call it different things. I think I called it in my orientation module, like questionnaire upload or something like that. It's the getting to know you survey that Michelle kind of mentioned in her talk as well. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you think about your students, right, you have uh, a sea of students, uh, but you really need to get to know them kind of one-on-one -on -one a little bit, right? You don't want to just have this mass of students and they all kind of become this blob. We really need to know them individually and what's happening with them. Um, and so you can ask them through this survey, um, like, do they have a preferred name, their, their pronouns, uh, specific life circumstances, right? Especially right now, there's tons of students who have mentioned something like, I'm at home uh, with my kids who are also doing school online, and maybe there's a limited number of computers or things like that. Things that, you know, may not be a problem today, but you don't know what's going to come up in the semester. And so it's nice to just give them a chance. It also shows that you're, you're showing that care from the very beginning, that you're interested and not just do this work and that's it. You're taking into account their life circumstances. So it's a great way to connect with them one-on-one -on -one because each one, instead of having to share out to a group, right? So you don't make it a discussion, but instead they put it down and you have it for each person. Um, and what I also actually do for my, uh, I do it a questionnaire upload instead of just like a Canvas quiz because I know that they'll be uploading documents for assignments throughout the semester. And so that serves also as a practice. So it's not just the first assignment that they try to figure out how to upload. We get it on this first, like no stakes, pretty much you get credit when you turn it in late or not, um, they get their practice of trying to upload. So you can actually kind of build in practice with the tools with how you integrate your orientation module as well. And a key benefit that I really love uh, from this welcome survey is to make use of this new notes column uh, in the Canvas gradebook. So you can actually, um, if you haven't noticed this column in your gradebook, either it's not showing. And so if you want it to show, just click on view. And you'll see the drop down and there's an option under columns that says notes and you want to make sure that there's a check mark next to it. Um, because then if there is, this is where you can enter notes and the students cannot see this. This does not show up on their end when they view grades. And so you can put like their preferred name. Uh, you can write more. So this was like a longer note. They may need extra time for blah, blah, blah. And I just did this um, with just so you can see how it looks. So it's an ellipsis and then you would click it and it would open a whole big box and you see that full note. Um, and so it's really useful. Like if you're in your grade book and you see a student, um, you need to email a student or something like that. You can write in there, um, see how to message them. You can see what name they prefer, all of that all in one. So definitely make use of this uh, notes column. It's so great. Um, it is a gem. I just absolutely love that. <laughs> Um, and then next, something else that you can think about doing in your orientation module that you can also actually use um, a little bit as you continue is building discussion. That's one of the benefits that we get from being in the classroom, right? We have this sense of community and everyone kind of discussing things together. Um, but you can also do this online, even asynchronously. Um, so I love this idea of the think pair share, but the asynchronous version. Um, so oftentimes in the class, we might do something where we pose a prompt to students and they think about it on their own. Then they maybe talk about it to students who are near them. And then we have a larger class discussion, right? Really building that community. Um, if you wanted to do this online asynchronously, you can as well. So you can create small group discussions. So instead of creating a discussion board for the entire class, you create this discussion, but then you can randomly assign people to groups of let's say five or something, depending on what they're discussing. And you can make it where the individual students have to post before they can see other students' response, even in that small group. So that's the think on their own. They have to post before they can see what other people did. And then they're pairing up in these small, smaller groups to discuss um, that topic, that prompt. And then you can have each group designate someone like the class poster essentially and create another class discussion board um, that posts everything from that group so that everyone in the class still has access to that group discussion. I really love this. So you can do some kind of discussion to begin in the orientation, but also you can think about that in terms of just building that community uh, in your classroom. So oftentimes I think with the switch, we were like, oh man, I really love this thing in class and how do I bring it online? 
know that you can. There tend to be ways. We have to do it slightly differently, but we can oftentimes actually find a way to, to, to bring that into our online courses as well. Um, and so that's the kind of orienting students, some ideas there. Um, now let's talk about continuing that throughout the semester, creating this welcoming environment that feels human all throughout. Um, and so we're going to do that by talking about continuous one on one connections, creating spaces to connect and building in moments to catch your breath, uh, both you and your students. Uh, and so first, we'll start with this continuous one on one connections. Um, and so we talked about like the welcoming survey as being one of those first uh, one on one connections you can make with your students, uh, especially if you just, you know, do a quick response to students who submit back just like thank you for sharing or something like that, even if you don't have time to you know, talk at length to each student and what they put. Um, that gives you a chance to just connect with them one on one. And you can do that kind of survey throughout the semester so you can maybe make it optional where they can submit any time just kind of like a check in that's asking them how's it going. Um, what was difficult from the material this week anything going on in life right now that you just want to share. And so they're still one on one and you can communicate and go back and forth with um, your students in that format, but it keeps that going where they don't feel like they've ever gotten lost that you're still providing an opportunity where they can talk one on one with you. Because oftentimes there are students who have like life things going on and they may not share it right and it's um, and so it's letting them know it's okay I understand so don't just think you have to like, you know, muscle through the course on your own. So keeping those connections going. And then also there's this message students who function in the great book as well. If you haven't used this, oh my God, I love it for one-on-one -on -one connections. It's so quick, it's so easy and it can do so much. Um, so if you're in the grade book and you see assignments and don't worry, these are clearly FS. These are two fake students with my name, right? So these aren't real students. Uh, but if you go to an assignment, you can click this vertical ellipsis is how I refer to it. And there's this message students who option. And it's so fantastic because if you click on that, it opens up this dialogue for you and you could choose something like haven't submitted. So you're gonna message students who haven't submitted this particular assignment. And it also shows you who would fall in that, into that realm. So also, even if you didn't need to message people at that moment, it's also a great way to just check in if you wanted to know exactly which students done, have done what. Um, and it fills in, it auto populates the subject line for you saying no submission form. You can change this if you want, but it auto populates that. And the message is actually blank. And then you can just fill it in like, hey, a reminder that this assignment is due on such and such. So if it's getting close to the due date or was due if it's past the due, late, due date and you wanna let them know. And then you also can just reach out with this kind of personalized message. I'm not just telling you that, hey, it's due, just checking in. Do you have questions about the material that's holding you up? Do you have life things going on? So it creates this personalized um, thing because each student, they can't see who else got emailed, right? So it creates this email that looks like it just went to that student. It doesn't though. So keep that in mind. Don't actually address a student name in your message, um, but it creates that one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and if you click this drop down, not only do you have the option of who haven't submitted yet, but if it hasn't been graded yet, so maybe if you're someone who re auto releases your grades and maybe something's come up and like half the class is graded and the other half isn't and you're, you're thinking that they're probably getting itchy, you might want to like message the students whose grades haven't came out yet. Like, hey, they'll be out soon. Um, the scored less than, right? So you can at once uh, message all students who didn't get a passing grade. So you end up having something where you can put in the, the exact value that you want. So maybe you message everyone who didn't get at least 70. Um, and just like, hey, I see this wasn't you know, your best assignment. Can I help in any way? But then also the one that I think gets overlooked sometimes is scored more than. This is such a missed opportunity if you're not using this. So you can do something like people who scored more than 90%. And then you can message them like, fantastic job. I see you did excellently. You aced this assignment. And then if you have like a discussion board where students can help one another, you can say, hey, you, have you offered any advice to the other students in the Q&A? You could definitely, clearly based on like what you've done, you'd be great at that. So oftentimes we tend to reach out to students only when they need help and things like that. This is a great way to build those one-on-one uh, -on -one connections and keep recognizing students, even when they're doing great things, right? Like that's such a, a key component to really reward those students as well. And this message students who makes it very easy uh, for us to do that. Um, and so now uh, Keith's gonna talk about some more spaces that you can use to connect with your, your students throughout the course. Some good stuff going on in chat. Um, yeah, so that one on one support, but also um, building in peer to peer support spaces is important too, right? That, that will take some of the pressure off of you having to be the only point of contact for every student in every one of your classes. Um, and then, and just like designing physical spaces for connection, digital spaces also have to be designed to foster that sense of connection. So perhaps it's Canvas discussions on a consistent basis to get students connecting with each other. Um, students can create groups with Pronto to stay connected with each other as like a group messaging kind of tool. 
They could form study groups and meet on Zoom. You can encourage students to attend the webinars put on by Student Services together. So I know Student Services did um, game nights on Zoom in the fall. And by sharing information about things like that, you're, you're kind of encouraging students to create those spaces to connect with each other, um, to foster those peer-to-peer uh, -peer connections too. So however, it, however, there's lots of different ways to do it, but the, the, the point is to just make the space so that you are doing it, um, so that students know that that's important um, to you as well. And then the next one, ongoing moments to catch our breath, is especially now, especially given the circumstances that we're in um, now, right, is really building in ways to catch your breath. So this is kind of a moment for us to catch our breath. Um, you can build these into your sessions too, build these into your courses. Um, a great tip that was shared in Teaching Tree last semester was to schedule a catch-up week halfway through your semester. This won't always be possible, I know, but um, if you can, to just create the space to allow your students to catch up, to allow you to catch up, um, kind of intentionally carving out space where there might be. There's other ways to kind of build in space and build in grace. I know Kara Smulovitz uses the late pass policy where I think for two assignments, she allows students to submit late, no questions asked. So they, if they're submitting late, they're saying I'm using, I use in the comments field, I think they say I'm using one of my late passes for this one or dropping the lowest quiz score, for example. So there are ways that we can give students some grace and um, and build in ways for them to catch their breath. I also noticed in the humanizing keynote with Michelle, she mentioned she had like a success plan on her liquid syllabus. And it was like building in, she had like a Monday through Friday, kind of a weekly plan that if students followed and, and part of that weekly plan was the weekend, like have everything done so that the weekend can be about disconnecting and getting offline if it's possible. Um, so to build that in as a way um, that would work with the due dates that you do have set. So it's not always possible, but if we can find spaces to do this, I think it'll be um, you know, a, a healthy thing to incorporate into our online teaching for our students and for ourselves, because it's a lot. It is a lot, and it's really hard to do this. There's some good stuff, dropping lowest quiz score, yes. Any other, we're, we're, we're open to ideas that you have here. I feel like this is where we could um, really share some good ideas on how to create that space and grace for our students this semester. And I think this transitions us into the hands-on element to give you guys a chance to touch up your home page. Yeah, we're going to show you um, again how to check accessibility, how you can, uh, if something comes up, how you can deal with those. Uh, we'll go over just some very basic editing if you haven't had a chance to look at the new rich content editor, um, some tips and things about inserting uh, links um, external, but focusing on like within your Canvas course links, images, YouTube videos, uh, division line. And then if there's time, I really want to show you just some basic HTML. Uh, oftentimes we, we scurry away from it <laughs> because HTML, if you haven't done it, it's just a block of text and it looks scary. Um, but you don't have to know HTML actually, you just need to know how to copy and paste and edit stuff. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk on that if, there, if there's time. So I'm gonna switch over um, and actually bring up just a demo page. Um, that I can use to walk us through. Sorry, give me just one second. I'm going to pull that up. John, I like that idea that you shared in chat, giving students the opportunity to present in their formats, formats that they're, they're comfortable with. That's cool. The best part is, is they get so creative. Yeah. And it's stunning. I've had them do infographics. You know, those little fast videos, the cartoon videos, yeah. um, because they're so technologically savvy. If you have students who are really have struggling with the written word, this is a better, is a great way to give them the opportunity to be successful. And to show off their, like you say, creativity. Right. 
So here I've just created a, an extra page just to demo some of these things. And I'm just gonna be going through really quickly, just kind of touching the surface and showing you these things. Uh, but do, if there's questions or if I need to repeat something, put that in the chat, Katie will stop me in my tracks and I can address that in the moment. Uh, but know that I'm just kind of giving a quick overview in the, the little time that we have of some of the things that we touched on that you might wanna to try to include in your homepage. Um, and so you should be able to hopefully see um, my, um, a Chrome window. And then there's also this other window, the image we're going to drop in is a smiley face. So that's just why that's there. Okay. So here I just put some basic text to get us started so that we can see it. Um, so you might have welcome, uh, you might have a header and some text, another header, another section, some text. So some of these tips are going to be really useful because not only can you use it on your homepage, but general pages uh, that you create as well. So I'm going to go ahead and click on edit uh, to edit this page. And so we can start with if you have like the welcome, of course, so the a uh, new rich context editor, you can easily just highlight it um, and you can change um, you know, the font color and things like that if you want. You can increase uh, the size of the text, things like that. So this is pretty much uh, stayed the same and it's kind of familiar to us from other like um, word processing applications and things like that. But a few things that I'll mention is, let's say you wanted to have a header. Oftentimes something we'll do is this is the header for this body text and we'll maybe just make it uh, larger. And so then that's our header, it stands out, is visual. However, this is something, if we were to try to check it on the accessibility builder, so let me change this uh, highlight because that's gonna be a problem, red and black text. <laughs> um, so let me just remove that. Or I'm just gonna ignore that then. <laughs> there we go. So this header, if I did the accessibility check, so this guy in this circle, um, it's gonna say it still has that background issue that I, I did here. So ignore that for a second. I should have um, changed that highlight. It's just being weird. Every time it goes perfect until you have to actually demonstrate live, right? So ignore that. But it didn't catch that there's actually an issue with this header because this is where you have to sometimes be a little bit smarter than the accessibility is a tool, but it doesn't know that this is actually a header. It may think that this is just text. And so it's actually labeled as paragraph. And so someone who uses a screen reader, it's not going to interpret the header the same way. It's not going to stand out the way it does just because it's a larger size. So something you want to do is actually go ahead and highlight that and change it to a heading. Um, and it might have come pre-formatted already if you do that. And then you can still tweak it. You can still make a header and you can make it 12 point font if you want it. But it changes how it reads to people who need that accessibility issue, that it's labeled properly, that this is just paragraph body text and this is a meaningful header to help them denote what's coming up, up uh, type of thing. So that segment, make sure it's not just visual, but that is also something that uh, screen readers can see um, as well. So that's something uh, that's gonna be very important to include. Um, something else is um, how do you include a link if you want to send students so like I don't have any text on my homepage right but I need still students to still get to the syllabus and things like that, for example, so you might have something where you want to say check the syllabus to students so you just write out what you want. And then you can highlight that text and how you create a internal canvas link is you would go to that insert menu and you would go to link. And so you could do an external link, so send them to a different website, but we're gonna click course links. This sends them somewhere inside your course. Um, and so then you could have sent to a specific page, a specific assignment, quiz, or in this case, course navigation, and I'll choose syllabus. And so there we can see it just turned it into a link. And something that's nice is if you notice, I actually over here have syllabus in this particular development shell um, where it's not visible to students, but I'm still able to get them there. So know that you don't have to give them this long laundry list that can confuse them in terms of navigation. You can keep this streamlined and still have students where they can get where they need to get. So you don't have to have students able to see all the quizzes at once, all the assignments at once. You can link them specifically and help direct it and keep it cleaner and clearer for your students. Um, so that is uh, one thing, creating that link. Hopefully we'll have time and I can show you how you can make that a button if you wanted to. Uh, but next I just wanna show you inserting images and uh, navigating those. So if I wanted to insert an image, insert image um, and you could choose from user images that you have in your general canvas account course images that you have saved just within that course or upload an image that's not anywhere yet and i love that it's now just drag and drop so i can go to my uh, finder window now and i could take this image and i'm just going to drag it and drop it here and also what i love about this new thing is it automatically has it very easy for you to enter alternative text so you can type something 
that describes the image. And you always should do this because again, screen readers, if someone can't visually see this image, uh, but it's meaningful and they need to know what's there, describe it to them so their screen readers can read it. If it's something that's purely uh, just there for kind of show and it's really not important, you can click it and make it a decorative image. And that kind of grays out the alt text is gonna uh, be um, properly kind of skin skipped over or handled in the screen reader. Um, and then you can click submit and it will enter that photo right there. And we can see it's very large, right? So we can click on it and just drag it down to size if we want. Um, but you can see it also does weird things with your text, right? So something that you can do is if you click on that image, so if you have it highlighted, you can click this alignment and you can choose to align it to the left and that's gonna actually wrap the text around that image. So that's an easy way if you ever wanted your text so that your image isn't just, oftentimes you might uh, feel like it's stuck being like centered in your text is underneath it, but you can actually just change the alignment. And it, again, you're not highlighting the text, you're highlighting the picture, the image that you have and doing the left alignment and that aligns the text next to it. Um, and you can see that the text actually bumps right up against it. Um, and yeah, you could do it right or left, absolutely. Um, and the text bumps right up against the image, especially since this is a PNG, so there's no white space border, it just ends at the circle. I'll show you two ways if there's time, how to get around that and add a little bit of space. Uh, one's a bit of a hack that some people do and another is using just a little bit of HTML um, and so it's accessible and you have full control over that space. Um, but before we do that, I wanna show you also inserting a YouTube video really quickly. Um, so you could do insert um, and you would end up doing embed is what I recommend for a YouTube video versus a link, especially if you want it to show in that Canvas page. So you can click embed and you need embed code. So how you would get that is you would need to go to the YouTube video. So this is just a lecture from uh, last semester. You would click share, and you would click that embed, and this gives you all the embed code that you need. And so then you click copy, and it will copy everything for you to go back to your Canvas page and just control V or command V to paste it. And so then you could go ahead and click submit, and it's nicely embedded into your course. But here's a trick that I'm gonna show you, because if you hit play on this video, um, and then you hit pause, you see these recommended videos that come up. I remember once I did this and it was like, I like, I like to watch stand-up comedy, stand-up comedy came up and I just went down a rabbit hole of stand-up comedy instead of staying focused on the course, right? So there's actually a way you can prevent these suggested videos from coming up uh, in the middle of the video or even at the end. And it's just a slight tweak to the embed code. So I'm gonna click on this uh, video and just delete it. And I'm gonna do the same thing, insert embed, and I'm gonna paste that same code. But here's the thing that saves you. You, have, you look for the URL, so where you see SRC, that source information, and then you have the HTML, that URL is in quotations. Go to the very end of that URL, um, but you're ahead of the quotation. So you're at the end of the text, but inside that quotation mark, and you're simply gonna type question mark, R-E-L, all lowercase, equals zero. And so maybe Katie can just put that in the chat as well so you know. I'm just adding question mark, R-E-L equals zero. And then you click submit, is there a and it looks the same. I'm sorry? Is there a semicolon or I put a semicolon in there. Maybe there's no semicolon. No semicolon, no semicolon, okay. just the zero. No. And then it'll be the quotation. And so you have it and it looks exactly the same. But when you click play, it won't let me play this with the embed code when you're in the edit. So I would just have to save this so I can show you how it actually plays for students. So now if I were to click play of this video, it starts playing, I hit pause. It just pauses on the video. There's no related videos that come up. When a student mm -hmm. finishes the video, there's no recommended videos at the end. It doesn't distract them. It's an easy way, just add that little bit of code. There's no distraction to the videos for students. And so you just recommend that they watch it in Canvas. They can click full screen from within Canvas, but then you're able to control it so that there's not those distractions um, anymore. Um, and so that's a nice trick if you have videos um, in your, in your um, page. Another thing, I had this other section, just to show you that they added something with the rich content editor that you don't have to do through code anymore. And that's insert, a horizontal line. And so that can create a nice division if you're trying to add these uh, spacing elements as well. And this is going to be um, accessible in H HTML proper. Um, so that's another great way to do that. Um, and then you can also um, modify like the size and stuff like that, but we're not gonna get into that here just to show you what that is. Um, and so we're actually um, at our time. Um, if you guys had five more minutes, I can show you really quickly the, the button and how to fix the the image spacing, but I don't wanna hold you guys because we can go to the wrap up. So if you guys can just very quickly um, in the chat, let me know if you want to see those very quick things that you can do, or if you want me to end, I could totally end there as well. 
But oh, I wanted to be up the rap slide. Guys. We can do the rap slide, and then maybe maybe people can hang out later if they want to see that extra stuff. You want to do it that okay, way? Okay, perfect. Yeah. So let's go back to the the wrap slide, and then I'll come back if you want to know. I can show you how to change this link into a nice button for you, um, and how you can space things out on your page without using tables. It's, trust me, it's so easy. It's so worth it. Stay around. Um, but let me switch back to our <laughs> I love uh, the presentation. Teaser. It's awesome. <laughs> So the only, I mean, the, the, the wrap for us, our last slide is really just to continue the conversations. Um, pull up those, those slides, um, Christina. We don't see them, but it's fine. We don't, we don't need that left. I forgot oh, to put there the we go. There we go. There yeah. <laughs> um, so we have the, just a reminder, we have got the paddle it, the paddle it, the catalyst padlet for day one. So whatever touching up you did or go, are going to do, um, on your homepage, make sure to share it um, on that catalyst, um, on the Padlet before midnight tonight. So that's for that opportunity drawing. Um, hopefully you have access to the Catalyst Canvas shell. Teaching tree, there's the link to the teaching tree, which is a space where these conversations can continue throughout the semester. So we actually, the loft um, just sent out the email for call for facilitators for the teaching tree. It'll be a space to have weekly Zoom sessions like this where we can share ideas and get a little bit of hands-on um, with colleagues as well. Stay tuned for Design to Align. That's gonna be our um, eight week kind of uh, faculty inquiry groups. So we're calling them FIGS and faculty can work together on aligning courses to um, OEI course design rubric, the Peralta equity rubric, so kind of like creating spaces for faculty to continue um, these conversations around course design. There's our email addresses, and that's all I'm gonna say for the wrap because I know people wanna see more HTML from Christina. So thank you for taking the time to join. Danica has a question. Real quick, uh, the Padlet is linked on our Canvas shell, right? Yes, it's there as well, yes. Thank you. Thank you all for joining. Hang out if you wanna find, uh, see more of Christina's HTML hacks. And if you That's don't, and you're hungry quickly. to get lunch, then we understand that too. Exactly, yes. <laughs> so let me just switch Thank back over to that share for all of this. It's really, really helpful. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you for being here and for being part of it. Yes. And baby too. He's working hard right now. <laughs> So cute. I'm gonna keep the recording rolling because I'm sure that you know, then we have these, um, this other HTML in the recording as well, Christina. Perfect, awesome. Thank you. So, okay, so I'll show you uh, these two quick, um, just kind of HTML getting started things. So first I'll start with the button. So if you wanted to change check syllabus so that it doesn't just have this link, but it was a nice little friendly button, I'm gonna show you how easy this actually is. So we have check syllabus and that's what we want to change. So to get from this rich content editor to the HTML, you're gonna go down here where you have these options. So that was our accessibility checker, word count. And then this here with the caret backslash caret is going to be your um, HTML. If you click this one, I do this all the time and click the wrong one. This is just going to make it full screen. So don't worry. It'll suddenly be like, wait, what happened? Just escape and it takes you back. Um, so this is the HTML one. So I'm going to go ahead and click that. And then we see all of that text. And here is actually not that bad because we don't have a ton of stuff on the page, but it's still pretty bad even without that much on our page, right? So here's how you can navigate. Something that I highly recommend using is you make use of your command F on a Mac, and I believe it's control F on a Windows, but it's gonna open, uh, search the page. So I know that I wanna change where it says check syllabus is where I want the link. So you can see it highlights, so I know exactly where in HTML I need to go. So that's a quick way to kind of navigate when you have all of this text, a nice shortcut. And if you ever wanted to add something, just to show you that shortcut as well. So this is a, a bonus tip really quickly. Um, if you had something else that was kind of buried in text and you didn't really know where you wanted to put it, I'm just gonna do, you do something like that where you just add something that's not real text, but you can type it in the triple X. So I, it's gonna be buried into this HTML a little bit. Uh, again, not that much on that page so I can find it, but if it was a long page with a lot of text, again, you could do that command F or control F 
And then I could search for that key indicator that I wanted, and then I could delete it and do whatever I needed to do in that section. So that's a quick way. So you're not just scanning through this HTML. You don't need all of it, right? You just need the section you want to work on. So we're going to go back to this check syllabus uh, that we saw earlier. And I'll just do this so it's highlighted again so we can see where I'm working. So we have this. So it's this one line of code, uh, which is the P to let it know is a paragraph all on its own. It's just that line by itself. Um, the title, it says A, uh, the title is where am I sending people to? Syllabus in the Canvas course. This herif is the actual URL. And then you have check syllabus, what it reads on the page. And so I can actually change that here if I wanted. I can add where it says check syllabus here. And you're gonna see that's what's gonna change what's read on the button later. Um, and so where I'm gonna go to make this a button, so easy, I tell you guys, this A and title, this space here. So I'm gonna click, this cursor is huge. I wanted you guys to see the pointer, but okay, so I'll move out the way. Is right after the A is where I click. And I'm just gonna do a space. So I'm right between A and title. So I'm right there between A and title. And this is all I'm gonna type, class equals open quote, capital B button, you need that capital B, close quote. That's it, class equals open quotation, button, close quotation. That is all you need to do. And then if you switch back over to the rich content editor, voila, you have still a link and no button, right? So it looks like nothing worked. That is because anytime you create a button, and I want you to know this, it doesn't show in the editor. So you have to click save so you can preview the page and then you'll see that it's actually a button. So don't be alarmed if you do that and you don't see it in the edit window, it doesn't show there. And so this is just your basic button that matches all of the other basic buttons as well. If you wanted your button to stand out, um, you can go back into edit and I'll show you just how quickly, and there's more on this in the Canvas site, but if I go back into the HTML and I go back to where I typed in button, you can do a space and Katie just put all of the different ones there. So I can do button double dash, so dash dash primary. So you just add that little bit at the end and this is gonna turn it to a blue button. You could do secondary and it's a dark gray button. You could do success as a green button. Warning is like an orange button. Danger is a red button. But then you do this and I can click save. And if we go back and look now is a blue button that stands out. So very quick, very little, right? So you didn't need to learn all of HTML. You just need to know how to do the search and find, get where you need to go. And you just add that little bit of code and suddenly you have a button here, right? And so now let me talk about how you can add space between elements. So we'll look at adding space between uh, the picture and the text, uh, but this also works if you're trying to space other elements out on your page as well. So there's, if I go back and click edit, so there's a hack that can be very, um, if you really don't wanna do anything with HTML, what I've seen people do is they'll take this image and they'll change it back to that center orientation and you can make it very large. And then what you can do is you can, that's a little bit too large for the window. There you go. And then you could click away somewhere in your text. And what you can do is, um, I don't know what the shortcut is on a Windows, but I know on like a Mac is Command Shift 4, but there's like a screenshot option and you could take a screenshot of the image and you can add this extra white space. So I'm not stopping my screenshot right up against the image. I'm adding some white space. And that way the text, when it butts up against the image, it's gonna butt up against the white space. So you've built in a border. So that's one way. And so then you would end up taking that image and you would insert that instead of the initial image. So that's a, a way to kind of get around it when you're doing that. But let's say you didn't want to do that. You wanted to really build in um, HTML friendly, easy space. Um, so you have this, the text is going right up against it. So what I need is to come in here and build space. So I'm gonna go back into HTML and I need to find uh, that image. Um, and so what's great is when you do that alternate text, you can see it there. So I could have searched for that alt text. I labeled that picture happy face. So that'd be another way to search again for that image so you can locate what image you want to find. And then this is where we have all of that image uh, information. So we have paragraph, image style. Um, this float is the stuff that went in the background when you did left line. But then what you want is to, where does your text begin? And so my text here, begins at that, so we don't have real words here, but it's that lorem, right? Um, so you wanna take note of where your text actually begins um, because then what you can do is hit enter at the beginning of that text. So you want it to be on its own line. I'm just gonna do some extra spaces so we can see where I'm working. And the HTML, if you do a space like this between paragraphs to extra space, HTML will clear that up. So this is an opening paragraph. I need to close that paragraph. So I'm just gonna go back to the end of that image that I cut off and I'm gonna do, um, the caret slash P is gonna close that off. So the same thing that you see at the end of all your paragraphs, right? You have an opening P, you need to close that P at the end. So you have that image isolated by itself. And then you have this closing P for your text, but we need to open it up 
so that it essentially is its own paragraph. But then here's the thing that's gonna give you that space that you need. So you're gonna come in here and you're gonna do space from the P and you're gonna end up typing style, S-T-Y-L-E equals open quote. And I want to build in some padding. So P-A-D-D-I-N-G dash, my padding is gonna be on the left side of my text. So padding left. If you need padding elsewhere, you can do padding right. You can do padding top, bottom, padding left. And then I'm gonna do colon. And I'm just gonna add a quick amount because I didn't know what it actually was. So I'm actually gonna do what I think is gonna to be too little, 50 and PX for 50 pixels. And then close that quotation. So this is what I essentially added to the paragraph for the text. So P style and then a space and just style equals open quotation padding dash left colon space 50 PX close quotation. And you put that into those brackets that are still part of that P, that opening paragraph. It's telling them how you're gonna um, style this particular paragraph of text. Um, and then I can go back into the rich content editor. And you can see it just did a weird kind of shift thing. It didn't actually do what I wanted. And this is great because you need to account for how much space is already being taken up by the image. And I know that this image is taking up more than 50 pixels. So you can click on your image and get image options. And not only is this a chance you can change your alt text and things again, but it shows you the pixels. So this is 91 by 91. So that means the space that I give needs to already account for how much space is being taken up by the picture. So I need at least 91 pixels. And then I can add a buffer. So I can add, let's say 20 points to that. And so then I can end up adding the space. So instead of being 91, I can make it 111 pixels is where I want my text to start. So I'm click done and I'll go back into that section and I'll see where I already had that information. And if you have trouble finding it again, again, control F and you're gonna see where did I type padding information? And it takes me back to where I was. Any, everyone seems to be following along. I'm hoping, making sure I haven't lost anyone yet. Um, and then you would go where I have 50. And I said, I wanted to account for the 91, that is the image, plus let me add 20 to it. So I'm gonna make it 111 pixels is the space. And then I can go back over and you can see that there is that space. That extra um, height is just because of a space there. So let me ignore this for just a second. I'm gonna do it one more time. All at once you can see how quick it is actually. So I just deleted that just to show you again. So I go back to my image where I want that text to begin. That's the beginning of the paragraph. I'm gonna do open paragraph with the P space style equals open quotation, padding dash left colon. I want this to be 111 PX pixels, close quotation, and then close that bracket for your paragraph. And then remember to just go back to that other one and close that paragraph where it's just the image as well. So that's all I actually did, right? So it looked longer as we were walking through it, but I wanted to show you that it actually is pretty quick, this edit. Um, and then I can go back in and you can see that there's that space again. So you can end up doing it and you could even do something just to show that that is what we have full control over. I could do something crazy big, 250 tons of space, right? So you have full control over how you space things out. And this is going to be fully um, HTML accessible as well. So if we go to that accessibility checker, all of those things we did is accessibility. So we're not just moving things around with a table, we can move things around with that padding um, as well. So thank you guys so much for sticking around. I just wanted to show you um, a few of the HTML things, how you can get started, make it a little bit less intimidating, hopefully. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to, to quickly answer those as well or anything. Christina is our new HTML guru. I am not. <laughs> Thanks everybody for joining in. I'm going to stop our recording. Perfect.